a recipe for a Halloween costume. Take one Valentine's Day. Okay, that makes sense. Add a touch of gothic horror, of course. Add a sousson of late 18th century fashion. And top it all off with a dash of 1980s new wave. Bake at 350 degrees for two hours. I think I can do that. After all, it's Halloween. <laughs> Oh, come here and give me a little kiss. Oh, look at it. Oh, you're so cute. Hey y'all, Jackie here and welcome to Fantastical Follies. Today we're going to be making an 18th century chemise gown with a twist. We're going to hop in a DeLorean and take the 1980s all the way back in time to the 1780s because nothing says Halloween to me more than The Cure. Nothing. That whole gothic love song thing is just... Friday. Also, if 1780s hair was 1980-ified, it would definitely look like Robert Smith's. I've had this yardage of red cotton voile in my stash with this gown of mine for more than a year. And yes, it's pronounced voile. It's the French word for veil. It's very thin cotton. Makes sense. So when Casey from Casey Renee Cosplays started talking about doing Halloween projects, I knew this would be the perfect occasion to finally do the thing and live my 1780s gothic dream in all its frilly glory. And yes, it's red. For those of you counting, this is number two. Now, before I get into making this gown, I need to take a minute to talk about the actual history of this article of clothing. It's important for us to acknowledge the history behind the clothing we make, and I don't just mean the historical accuracy of the technique. There's been a lot of discourse already on the fraught history of the chemise gown. I don't feel that I'm qualified to further the discourse, especially because I'm still learning, but I'd be remiss if I made a video about this gown without at least acknowledging the history and its negative impact on the lives of billions of people. We all know that when Marie Antoinette was painted in this gown, it caused a huge scandal. They called it the chemise à la reine because it looked like the queen's underwear. But this gown is actually a derivative of dress worn by black and indigenous women in the Caribbean known as the chemise à la creole. It was then appropriated by white colonizers before making its way into France and Marie Antoinette's wardrobe. Not only is this yet another example of colonizers appropriating black fashion and culture without acknowledging its origins, something that that is still being done to this very day. But it is also one of the reasons that lightweight cotton was popularized. We can follow its path from this gown through the French Revolution and into the Regency era. And with the popularization of cotton, we have to think about supply and demand. We have to think about where that cotton is coming from and how it's produced. And that it involved the enslavement of people the repercussions of which we still do not know the massive extent of. This is a very heavy topic, especially for a channel that focuses on humor, but it's important to talk about it and further our understanding. I've linked a bunch of videos discussing the chemise dress and its historical significance in the description, as well as linked to several Instagram accounts that further the discourse. Those in turn have linked to other great sources, and I highly recommend you taking some time to explore them. It's important that we challenge our inherent biases and educate ourselves. And not just because it's Black History Month or because it's trending somewhere. We should be doing this every day. We should be waking up and trying to be a better person than we were the day before. Okay, thanks for listening to my spiel. Listening? Listening. Listening to my spiel. Listen, listening to my spiel. Okay, there we go. I can talk. <laughs> Please let me know if you go explore any of the sources and which ones you felt were the most helpful. In addition, if you know of any other sources that I've missed, please leave me a comment and I'll add them to the description. So, chemise à la goth, chemise à la cure. I love The Cure. They're one of my favorite bands and Robert Smith's look is just chef's kiss. I've never been a big fan of Valentine's Day and honestly, I love the idea of it being Halloween's second coming. Yes, another excuse to dress up, Y'all, I am gonna have fun with this one. This is also a very easy make. If you're new to historical costuming, a chemise gown is definitely the easiest 18th century gown to start with. The most basic ones are just a rectangle of fabric gathered down at certain points. I mean, look at this. This is just like a chitin, but with sleeves added. On top of that, you can get away with wearing it without stays, and honestly, this gown translates from historical to history bounding with very little effort. It's an accessible pattern that doesn't use a ton of fabric and a great thing to have in your historical wardrobe, as long as you do your homework first. 
I'm gonna be using the Laughing Moon Pattern 133. This comes with two bodice and two sleeve options with further customization in the form of opting for drawstrings or not. I'm going for the fully gathered bodice B and the puffy sleeves A because the frillier, the better. Okay, let's make this thing. All right, my friends. So last night I got the skirts cut out for this gown. I'm not doing a mock-up for this. It's such a forgiving pattern. I'm not really worried about it. I did, however, put on the lining just to make sure that the, the length was okay and I think it's all right. As you can see, there's a lot of give to this. I'm gonna put a drawstring in it and close it in a drawstring in the back. That way I can wear it in my stays and also with regular modern underwear. My goal is to be able to wear this just to work and stuff. I think it looks pretty good. I'm gonna cut out the rest of this bodice. Now I will say that Almost a hundred sheets worth of this pattern was skirt pattern. And I started to cut them out and realize they are just two rectangles that are 45 inches by 46 inches. And you cut two of those for the back and one of those for the front. And so I was like, I'm not gonna put all that together. So I didn't, I just cut the rectangles. If you're going to make this pattern, be aware that that's all you have to do. Save yourself the time. Let's get the rest of this cut. I'm going out of order. Shh. Skirts first, baby. Why am I doing a skirts first? Because that's what I have time to do tonight. So that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> it shouldn't affect anything as long as I follow the instructions. There is one panel for the front, two panels for the back. I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. Ta-da! We now have a tube of fabric for the skirt. Yay! Six inch opening at the back, so you can get in and out of it. Now I was gonna fell this, but then I realized again that the sides are the selvages. So why spend all of that time felling those edges down when they're not gonna fray? Also, I really wanted to put pockets in this, but the way the dress is constructed with one center seam in the back, the seams are going to be not centered right on the side to allow me to put in pocket slits. If I wanted to put pocket slits in, I would have to physically cut the fabric and then roll it back. Because this is so lightweight, it's actually more lightweight than the red voile I used for Bowie's petticoat. I don't think that's a good idea because Bowie's petticoat is ripping something fierce and this is going to be even worse. I shall sacrifice to the pocket god and lose this time. I pinned the lining together for real this time, actually paying attention to my markings. I've surged all the edges of the lining for stability, although I won't be doing that with the voile because it's so delicate, I'm worried about serge or eatage. A quick note for those of you making this pattern, there are double notches in the strap, but there is no corresponding double notch on the lining piece. There is one on the bodice, however, so if you're attaching this, the notches go inward toward the arm side. Once all of that was sewn, I pinned the back together to test the fit. Once I got it where I liked, I sewed the straps on, as well as the two little tucks in the front of the lining meant to fit it to your bust. Naturally, I'm opting for the puffed sleeves and not the straight sleeves, and you can see how unenthused I am about it. The original garment that this pattern was based off of has piping around the armholes and the side back seam. It's marked as optional, but for this project, I decided it was a good idea since this fabric is so very delicate. I cut two strips on the bias for my leftover fabric, both one and a half inches wide. And then I did a ribbon dance. Of course I did. Sew the strips together, press it flat, and then iron it in half. The pattern suggests kitchen twine for this bit, but I had some red worsted weight yarn hanging around in an orphan ball, so I chose to use that instead. Use an invisible zipper foot for this if you have it, or just a regular zipper foot. Not your string of choice to anchor it, and place it into your bias strip as close to your fold as possible, and then sew using the zipper foot as a guide. Ta-da! Piping. Now it's time to assemble the bodice. First, pin and sew the side seams. Then, pin the piping to the side back seam.
Now, for as good as lapping moon patterns are, the instructions don't do a very good job describing this piping process. So I'm winging it, and forgive me if I'm doing it incorrectly. This piping is going to get turned to the inside of the garment. So I pinned and sewed as normal, but I'm sewing at a half inch seam allowance instead of the suggested 5 eighths. Now take the back piece and place it right sides together, pinning so the pins are just next to the piping. Now sew on the outside of the piping, in theory at the 5 eighths inch mark. Now, as you can see, the piping is on the inside of the seam. This gives the seam stability, an important thing with delicate fabric on the couple of seams that will get a lot of stress. I ran a set of gathering stitches on the strap and gathered the front of the bodice to the strap piece. Then do the same thing on the back portion of the strap and sew those babies on, woohoo! Okay, here's where my brain starts to spaz out. Instead of following the instructions and gathering the front of the bodice, I finished the ends of some half inch tape and I'm going to make a drawstring channel so I can adjust it to whether I'm wearing stays or not. I pinned the tape into the lining in between the dots. Then I realized that's going to mess up the gathering on the front bodice. What the heck am I doing? There's a drawstring I put in at the waist. This will achieve the same effect without all the weird extra steps. So I'm going to put the bodice together following the instructions, but I cut a waistband about four inches longer than my waist to give me some extra room. I'll then gather the front bodice to the width of the waistband and draw it in with the drawstring. Okay, Jax, now you're thinking. Woo! Happy Sunday, everyone! Do I look excited? Because I'm excited. You know why? I'm going to get this gown done today. Well, everything but the hem. I know I'm going to have to hand sew the hem. That's going to take me a couple of days, but otherwise, I think it's going to happen. It is going to happen. I will make it happen. Also, if you watched my Groundhog Day video, you'll know that uh, it's been raining and I'm really excited because the sun is out for a little bit. It has not been out all day. It's been really spazzy and dark and light and dark and light, but hey, sunshine on a day that I'm not novice. <sighs> okay, let's get down to the board and get this sucker finished. Run two sets of gathering stitches along the bottom of the bodice, stopping at the markings. Do the same for the neckline and the bodice back, paying attention to the start and stop points. Starting with the shoulder seams, I pinned the fashion fabric to the lining, then gathered the bodice back down to the lining on both the top and the bottom. Note that there's a section under the arms that does not get gathered to achieve a more flattering fit. Then do the same to the front of the bodice, gathering the bottom down between the markings. Then gather the neckline, spreading the gathers out evenly. I do recommend using two sets of gathering stitches on this bit as the double basting will give a much neater gather and make it easier to stitch. Sew down the neckline, making sure to leave the back inch and a quarter unstitched. Then trim the seams down to a quarter of an inch. Clip the curves and turn the bodice right side out. Press the seam down toward the lining. Then understitch the seam allowance on the lining side so it doesn't peek out over the top of your gown. It's really starting to come together now, folks. I'm so excited. Once that's done, base down the bottom of your bodice and the arm size, which I forgot to film. Now it's time to add the piping. We do this exactly the same as we did on the bodice back, pinning, sewing, and sewing over the piping so it turns to the inside. Puffy sleeves, puffy sleeves, puffy, puffy, puffy sleeves, puffy sleeves! Run two sets of basting stitches along the top, stopping at the underarms. Run one set in the middle of the sleeve if you want the double puff. <laughs> then two sets along the bottom edge. Sew the sleeve together. To prep the cuffs, fold in half and press. Then turn up one seam allowance but leave the other untouched. Sew the cuffs together at the sides. Gather the bottom of the sleeve down and pin to the cuff right sides together. So the edge of the cuff meets the edge of the sleeve. Once you've sewn the cuff, go ahead and trim down the seams. 
On the inside, press the seam allowance down toward the cuff. Flip the cuff over and pin the folded side down to encase the raw edges. I hand stitched this off camera. With that done, it was time to set in the sleeves. This is a very easy sleeve to set in, and as long as you've cut all your notches and made all your marks, it shouldn't be difficult to do, even for a beginner. If you opt for the longer sleeves offered in this pattern, it's probably a little bit more difficult because they're fitted. Another reason why puppy sleeves are far superior. So match all your notches and markings and pin right sides together. I always like to sew with the gathers on the top of the machine so I can keep an eye on things. Gather between the markings and distribute the gathers evenly. Now for my least favorite part of this project, the ruffles. These are optional. The method suggested is also optional. Hint, hint. So the arm ruffles and neck ruffles are exactly the same, though you can adjust the size based on your preference. Roll hem one edge like you see here, and then sew the ends together on two of the strips for the arm ruffles. The remaining two sew into one very large circle for the neck ruffle. The instructions call for single fold bias tape. Measure the width of your cuff and neckline and cut pieces of the bias tape. Pin the bias tape onto the cuff and gather the ruffle to fit. Note to self, don't do this with the door open on a windy Sunday. That wind's blowing my ruffle around like Dorothy in a tornado. There it goes. <laughs> Shut the darn door, continue. Once they're sewn, trim down the seams. Really trim them down this time. You'll thank me later, it gets bulky. The neck ruffle procedure is very weird. You're going to take the ruffle and place it wrong side to the right side of the bodice front and then fold the bias tape over and pin it onto the lining. Then hand stitch the lining down. Was I really thinking I'd get this done today? <sighs> Never in a million years, Jax. Those who do not learn are doomed to repeat the same mistakes. Based on the fabric waistband, then flip the bodice over and apply the lining waistband if you're using it. Then stitch through all layers. The instructions then say if you'd like to sew tape to the top of the back to tie it closed. I did that. Fun fact. There is no universe in the world where that's going to stay hidden. I need quarter inch tape. I don't have quarter inch tape, so I'm just going to take some half inch elastic, make it a little bit smaller than I want and stick it in the top. Time to elasticize. I sewed a small strip of elastic about three and a half inches away from each side back, making sure to sew the elastic in a little box for stability. Then I carefully pinned around the elastic to form a casing, allowing the fabric to move freely. Here's the finished casing. See, freedom of movement allowing for me to expand or contract and the gown to still fit. I might put a hook and eye here later. Now onto the skirt. Quarter it out and then like everything else in this project, run gathering stitches on each quarter. I do suggest doing it in four stages because there is so much bulk here that it'll be much easier to get it even that way. With right sides together, pin the top of the skirt to the bottom of the waistband. I'm straying from the instructions here and leaving the lining free so I can encase the raw edges later. Gather the skirt to fit the waistband and pin, working each quartered section separately and making sure the gathers are distributed evenly. Alakazam, skirt is attached. Press the seam allowance up toward the waistband. Then flip the waistband lining down, turn the edges under and press. Off camera, stitch these down using a hem stitch and also stitch in the center back lining to the center back fashion fabric. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the land of ice. We're in the middle of an ice storm. Ice storm, it's not raining right now, which is great. Uh, but if you can look outside, like all of the trees are covered in ice. I did lose power for about an hour and a half very early this morning. But other than that, I've been very lucky. I haven't lost any power. The issue this time around is that all of the ice on the trees has made all of the trees fall down on the power lines. Fingers crossed that I keep the power on. Anyway, last night I got the ruffle attached to the front and I have regrets. Woo 
I'll tell you what, putting that ruffle on with that stupid bias tape has been a complete nightmare. It has taken three times as long. I understand why you're supposed to do it with bias tape, but in the future, if I ever do another chemise gown, which I might, I might make a white one, I'm not going to fill around with bias tape. I'm just going to surge the edge of the ruffle and tack it on because it has just been so fiddly and frustrating because there's so much extra fabric on the bodice that I keep accidentally tacking up the bodice. <sighs> but it looks good. So the ruffle on the sleeve gets put in differently than the neck ruffle instead of doing the weird like flippy sandwich thing where you have the bias tape on one side, then the bodice and then the ruffle. It just gets tacked into the sleeve and sewn down and then you flip the bias tape around and cover up the raw edges. That's how the sleeve ruffles get put in, took much less time, much less stressful, yay. All I have left to do on this is to put in the waistband drawstring, and I've kind of been trying to figure out what I wanna use for that. I'm going to try 1 8 inch cotton tape because I have that handy. That doesn't work, I may end up making a waist tie out of my leftover red fabric, but I really don't want to have to do that. I really don't. So hopefully that tape will work. And then all I have to do is the hem, which I've been putting off for two days because it's 56 degrees in here. And this gown was made for Texas summer weather, not the coldest days of the year. <laughs> but I have to hem the stupid thing over my rump and I need to get my stays and stuff on to do that. So I think I'm just going to I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do. It's gonna be unpleasant. But is it worth having a weird hem if I do it on Gertie instead? I don't know. We'll see what I decide. Nope, the 1 8 inch tape is too narrow. I really didn't want to make a tube that skinny, so I decided to just use my half inch tape. So I stuck a safety pin onto the end and threaded it through the waistband. Now featuring my high tech and snazzy way of keeping the tail end from slipping into the waistband. Totally sanitary. All right, it's done. The last thing I did was the hem. I don't know why I never filmed the hem. Partially, I think, because it's boring. <laughs> Nobody wants to see me just turn up the edges of the skirt. Now I did and uh, pinning it on Gertie to try and make the hem even and then put it on my body with all of the kit on and kind of evened it out a little bit. I don't think the hem is perfect, but because this dress is so full, I don't really care. <laughs> It'll be fine. But I did do the hem. I hand stitched the hem down. I will say that more than likely, it's not gonna happen today because I don't have the supplies right now, but I'm thinking about just putting elastic in the waistband instead of a drawstring. I like the flexibility of this. I know it's not historically accurate, but I think it's gonna be a lot easier to get on and off if it's just elastic. I'm worried about having to deal with the ties. And frankly, it's quite bulky. I can't quite get it to cinch around my waist the way I want it to. We'll see. I'm gonna wear it a couple of times before I make that decision, but that's what I'm thinking I'm gonna do. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time to hang out with me today. I love making these videos and it means so much that you're here. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't. It really helps my weird little channel get seen and tells the algorithm that this is the kind of thing you like to watch. You can also hit the little bell if you wanna be notified every time I upload new content. And if you're looking forward to seeing my next project, don't forget to hit that little like button. All right, let's go get this baby on and have a little fun.
wind is killing me. By far the least goth of any instrument ever created. Why I learned all of the Cure songs on this and not my electric guitar, I don't know. And if you've enjoyed this 1980s goes for Coco video, why don't you go check out this video, which is the 1970s but Rococo.